Okay, so we're picking up with an X-Men one-shot, which is technically issue number 20, and it's actually further ahead from the last place we were. We basically stopped with the end of X of Swords. Uh, if you guys want me to cover all the stuff between X of Swords and now, we can. I don't see any reason not to. And the other question I have is, do you guys care about anything that's not X-Men related? Because if you don't, I'll just hold off on that stuff. Some of that stuff's cool and I'll cover it anyway, but let me know what you guys think. Uh, having said that, if you guys remember, there was a story that we did previously when Mystique was sent on a mission and then she returned. And when she returned, she was gravely injured, but we didn't really know exactly what was going on. This basically fills in a lot of those gaps, right? It's the nature of Hickman, right? We're kind of jumping back to a degree. And so one of the things that we'd seen previously is that Irene Adler, who's actually really was a, a topic of discussion on Twitter, where people were asking if Mystique had a romantic relationship with Irene Adler, and the answer is yes. Uh, Chris Claremont never really hit it on the nose. He was never like, and they're together, and they're sleeping together. You know, it wasn't really anything like that. But by all standards of measurement, you could basically look at the context of the situation and know that they were a couple. They refer to each other as lovers pretty consistently. And so because of that, um, one of the things that's gone on here is Irene Adler is, as a lot of you guys know, Destiny. But Destiny has not been resurrected. And the ongoing theme here, the reason why is because with Charles Xavier and Magneto running Krakoa, there's something kind of sinister going on with everything they're doing. More so than that, the entirety of Krakoa hinges on hope. That's it. That's all it hinges on. The idea that as long as the mutants are there on that island, their future is basically guaranteed. If I'm a betting man, I would say that, that Professor X and Magneto are more or less using all the mutants as cannon fodder, but they see them as, a, as almost like messianic characters. They don't really worship them as gods, but they're the people who kind of came along with a plan that was really formulated by Maura McTaggart, and it was, we can all sort of save ourselves and live in a singular location, that kind of a thing, right? We can have a, a home unto our own. That's not like Genosha, where like 16 million of us were murdered, right? We'll be safe here. And so that's why a lot of the mutants that existed out there ended up casting aside their differences. Former villains took up residence on Krakoa, so long as they follow the rules. The big issue here is that with Destiny, she can see the future. If you guys remember the old stories with like Destiny's diaries, she can see the future. And so if Destiny's brought back and she knows what's going to happen, and presumably, even though we don't know it yet, the future is going to be laden with just mutants dying all over the place because Krakoa is going to prove to be a failure, that information would come out and people would abandon Krakoa, right? So Destiny just hasn't been brought back. Now we're assuming that's the case. We don't know definitively if that's true or not, but it's one of these things where Mystique trusts Destiny implicitly. And so one of the things that kind of goes on is ultimately Mystique travels to meet with Forge. Now Forge is a character that we've talked about before and for a lot of you guys who are new and who are unfamiliar with Forge, imagine him as being the Tony Stark of the mutant population. The difference between Forge and Tony Stark is Tony Stark is just legitimately intelligent. Forge's intelligence is a result of his mutant power. And so if you took his mutation away, he'd be nowhere near as capable as he is right now. But with his mutation, he is in a lot of ways on par with Tony Stark. But the result of this is that Mystique and Forge kind of have this discussion where they're talking about sort of creating tools, right? This idea that when Mystique says she needs Forge to work on something, the response of Forge is, well, it depends on what it is that you want. And in the right hands, anything is a weapon. Like I can create something like, I can use a stick. And in the right hands, a stick is a weapon. And he kind of talks about the nature of humanity and says that humanity for the most part, always start out with the, the logic of, we were starting with the good intentions, right? We started with good intentions and look at where we ended up. And he says, it's always the same way. Like the, the combustible engine, computer processors, atomic energy, genetic engineering, that it all ends up starting with quote unquote the best of intentions and then look where they are. They're using technology rooted in combustible engines to create engines of war. They're using computer processors to develop sentinels that are anti-mutant. Atomic energy led to the nuclear age, the just the you know death tolls on a massive scale. Genetic engineering led to the desires to remove powers of not just mutants, but superpowered beings across the world all equally. It's one of these things where humanity has always taken the, the tools that they had that were used with or at least developed with good intentions and then weaponized. Them. And it's really kind of pointing the finger at this idea that it's in the nature of humanity to screw stuff up. It's in the nature of humanity to do things that are inherently bad, right? We're inherently self-destructive. And it's kind of an interesting philosophy because one of the things that I find so intriguing about the way that, that Jonathan Hickman writes mutants is that there was never a definition more accurate of the mutant population than during Days of Future Past, when Sentinels came to the realization that mutants are the next stage of human evolution. Therefore, mutants are humans or simply just modified humans with a modified gene. But at the same time, they're almost pretty much the exact same way, right? Mutants follow the same logic as humans. It's not as though developing an X gene suddenly leads to you understanding and, and developing a higher state of reasoning, right? Like you're still human at your core in terms of how you function, how you think, emotions, all that kind of good stuff. And so it's 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 really cool because mutants almost seem to kind of see themselves above the human population, despite being a part of the human population in terms of how they think and feel. There really isn't a whole lot of difference there. And so that's what's so ironic is because with this discussion going on between the two of them is basically revealed the job 
job of Forge is to develop a weapon for Mystique to carry out a mission, right? To essentially develop a bomb. And all of this is rooted in Orcus. Now, what we end up doing is kind of transitioning to Mystique when she travels to the House of M, which is basically the base of operations where at least kind of like the private citadel where the council meets, right? Where you have Xavier, you've got Magneto. And we basically end up finding out that what happened is Forge created a microscopic singularity generator. Basically, he created an artificial black hole. When the bomb goes off, an artificial black hole will basically grow. An artificial black hole will come into existence and then blink out almost in the blink of an eye. But because artificial black holes and even black holes in general have such a strong gravitational pull, that's all they need. And so the idea is that when the bomb goes off in the Orcus space station, it'll quite literally destroy the station itself. It won't really destroy anything else, right? It won't destroy Sentinel City where they're developing all the different Sentinels that are there or their system of orbital platforms, but basically it'll kill the heart of the Orcus operation. And after that, it's just cleanup duty. And so because of that, the whole purpose of Mystique is to go there and pull this off. And she's supposed to be doing it on her own. And so what she ends up doing is actually donning the disguise of a, a member of Advanced Idea Mechanics operating within Orcus. Now, a little bit of jumping back here, right? Because again, this is the nature of Hickman. We're going all the way back to Hassan Powers of X with a lot of these references here. So one of the things, if you guys recall from that, is that Orcus was a multinational organization that basically had a, a lot of members from different groups that were part of its mission, right? So Advanced Idea Mechanics, Hydra, just ordinary uh, human scientists, all kinds of different things. But it existed for the singular purpose of finding a way to destroy the mutant population on Earth, right? It's really, in a lot of ways, the biggest gambit of humanity, right? The single largest undertaking of humanity and trying to eliminate mutants. Up to this point, it was just laws that were being passed or the Mutant Registration Act or something like that. And in a lot of ways, they didn't really have much teeth. Groups like Friends of Humanity, for those of you guys who remember the old school stuff back in like the 80s and 90s, stuff like The Right, those kind of organizations actually came closer to destroying the mutant population. Even guys like William Stryker, they came closer to destroying the mutant population than the government ever did. But the government was also bound by laws. You know, the government couldn't just arbitrarily create sentinels and then send them indiscriminately across the world killing mutants. But Cassandra Nova could, or like the Friends of Humanity could, or William Stryker could. I mean, sure, they were violating the law in doing it, but as long as they stayed under the radar, everything was fine. With things like uh, Project Wide Awake, it was a lot harder to do because there were a lot more moving parts and a lot more organizations involved. And so kind of picking up at the Orcus Forge, if you guys recall Alia, she was married to Erasmus. And Erasmus was one of the guys who died facing off against the mutants in House and Powers of X. And while we haven't really seen what she's been doing, what we basically learn here is that she's been working on building the perfect Sentinel to, to essentially plant her husband's consciousness in so they can begin the, the, the process of developing more advanced Sentinels and then ultimately destroying humanity and then ultimately destroying the mutant population. The way she's done this is wildly intriguing because the philosophy behind Alia and even Orcus as a whole is when it comes to the Sentinels that exist out there, they abide by programming, right? Whatever it is their programming tells them to do, they will do. And they can't deviate beyond their programming, right? They're very limited in terms of how they function. But what if you could take a human being and you could take their consciousness, you could basically synthesize it, right? So all the memories you've experienced in your life can be broken down into basically binary code, ones and zeros, and then put into a machine. And so your essence and what makes you who you are is, is confined within this machine itself. But the machine itself is virtually indestructible with a whole host of abilities. And that's what she's done. She's taken her husband's consciousness and she put it in a sentinel. She basically created Nimrod. And so this is a huge change from what we're used to with the X-Men mythos. And we knew this was coming because of what Jonathan Hickman has done over the years of time he's been writing the X-Men and Marvel comics. Originally, Nimrod was created by other Sentinels. And that was one of the big failings of Nimrod. Despite his capabilities and what he could do, he was severely limited because he was limited by the programming that was given to him by other machines that were limited by their own programming. But unlike that, this is a human being. Humans have no limitations. We're 100% complete imagination. And so whatever we can conceive, we can create. And that's the big thing about Alia and about people like her is because she's not bound by that, the concept of just, we need to create a machine that can kill mutants. We'll make it super advanced. Instead, it's things like taking the artificial mind of a human being and putting it inside of a machine. And so when Erasmus wakes up, he suddenly starts to realize this is kind of weird to me, but at the same time starts to pick up on the fact that he's got all kinds of different abilities here. Now, this is the nature of Nimrod. And this is why I call Nimrod the dead deadliest enemy of all mutants. Because it's one thing when you're facing off against somebody like Apocalypse. Apocalypse is very capable and Apocalypse is exceedingly powerful. But Apocalypse's singular motivation is not to just eradicate the mutant population, it's to test both mutants and humanity to get rid of the weak. And so because of that, we're not talking about just outright elimination, we're talking about culling, 
more or less. With Nimrod, it's kill everybody, right? Every single mutant, just kill them all. Now, there is a little bit of difference here because you've got Erasmus inside this system, but nonetheless, Nimrod was designed with a host of abilities that made him the perfect machine to take out mutants. He could detect mutants pretty much anywhere within his immediate vicinity and figure out what their weakness was and then use that against them. He could basically duplicate almost any superhuman power that he saw. He could teleport, he could shapeshift. Nimrod could do it all. I mean, the guy was just a Swiss army knife of just weapons, right? I mean, it's just, he was literally a one man band. That's why he was made the way he was, was just to be the most efficient mutant killer that could possibly be found. The kicker to all this is that while Rasmus is limited to his physical form, he does have all these powers and all the imagination to go along with it. And so in a moment, he's actually sort of hugging Alia and, and really cherishing the moment that he's back and the gifts that she's given him. And then just kind of looks over and says, that's a mutant. Just like that, Mystique is caught. And it's just, that's that's the craziness of, of Nimrod, right? Like under any normal circumstance, they never would have known she was there. She could have just snuck through the whole place and she could have planted the bomb at her own leisure and then left and called it a day. But she's literally standing in the presence of a being with the power to sense mutants anywhere in his immediate vicinity. With Mystique's bluff being called, she does the only thing she can do. She basically runs. And so she essentially in the process activates the bomb. And this basically sets off or begins a process of creating this kind of singularity in the middle of the forge. The problem with Mystique's plan is she didn't fully understand what she was going to be going with. One of the first abilities that was given to Nimrod or given to Erasmus in the body of Nimrod by Alia was to make sure he couldn't die. And so she gave him the power to duplicate himself. The issue with this is that it takes time for the memory core to develop. And so once he immediately duplicates himself into several versions and then sends them out, some of which go after Mystique, the others actually gather together to get rid of the bomb that he's told by Alia, if you detonate this bomb, right, if you take this bomb out there and you die with it, all your clones basically die, we can, you know, your, your main version here that's with me right now will live, but you'll lose too many pieces of yourself, right? For every version of yourself that dies, you lose more of yourself along the way. And in the end, Erasmus says, that's a price I'm willing to pay, right? I love you. I miss you, but I understand that keeping you alive is the most important thing. And so what some of his versions do is they actually disconnect the, uh, the part of the ship with a bomb attached to it, float it out into space, and they all end up being destroyed along with it, right? The station's secure, but the bomb is detonated. And so when she asks Erasmus, are you there? Then like in turn, he just responds the way a robot would, right? Dr. Alia Gregor, I'm sorry to tell you what it is that I'm about to tell you, but basically her husband's gone. This is probably the single most important moment in Jonathan Hickman's run of X-Men up to this point, because for House and Powers of X, we didn't know how it was that we went from the arrival of Nimrod or the creation of Nimrod to this moment right here, where he kind of became like a robot, right? The robot that we all know and the one that we all love, to be honest, for us as X-Men fans, we just simply knew he was there at some point. And so because because that, this is the origin. This is the new origin of Nimrod in, in the X-Men comics, where basically he was engineered to be a hybrid between a human and a robot and lost his humanity almost immediately into being created. And so following that, one of his clones tracks down Mystique and then basically attacks her, blasts her right back through the portal to Krakoa and then tells her, tell your masters that you failed. Tell your masters that, I'm, that my system is online and it's only a matter of time before we come for them. Know that Nimrod the Hunter is alive and well and Nimrod will see the end of you all. And so you get this kind of amazing moment here where you pick up with Omega and you pick up with the leader of Orcus. Of course, Omega having been an Omega Sentinel once upon a time and was really the first attempt and, and really the, one of the first and only successful attempts to kind of make a human Sentinel hybrid. It worked out well, but then things kind of went awry because the reality was she had too much humanity in her. But the important thing here is that the leader of Orcus just kind of looks where, where Omega is just kind of like, man, like, you know, they almost killed us. Like, we need to be on our guard. The leader of Orcus is like, no, we don't, right? This tells us everything that we need to know, right? And kind of starts laughing at this whole thing. And when she asks what's so funny, he says like, we weren't hurt. Like we were not badly hurt at all. Like with the, with the exception of losing Erasmus or the Erasmus persona of Nimrod, we're not hurt. Like we're fine. Ultimately, they're afraid of us. If they weren't afraid of us, they would not have launched this mission. And so it means we're getting to them, right? Like it means our purpose is being served. With fear comes recklessness. And with recklessness comes mistakes. It's only a matter of time before we catch them off guard and we eradicate them all. And so following that, because the resurrection of destiny hinged on Mystique being successful in her mission, when she gets back, she basically has to tell Xavier and Magneto that she failed, that Nimrod is online. And this is when things really begin to start falling apart for Magneto and Xavier. And the reason for this is because the question that Mystique asks is, what about Irene? And they kind of look at her and say, what about her? This is the, probably one of the worst mistakes they could have made. And the reason why is because there are times when you really just kind of have to appease. But the risk they take by bringing back Destiny is that she would make everybody aware of the fact that the future is going to fall apart, that they're all probably going to be used as cannon fodder and ultimately executed and they're all ultimately going to die. And so what you get is this kind of voiceover or at least this kind of memory that was uh, 
the statement, I guess, that was told to Mystique by Irene at a, at a previous point in time before she died. And she said, at some point in time, Xavier and Magneto are going to create some kind of mutant utopia, a place that's going to be sort of billed to you guys as hopeful. But ultimately, they're selling you on a false bill of goods. This place will seem to be hope for our kind, for the mutant population. When those days come, when that mutant utopia is created and they come to you as saviors, bring me back. And if they cannot do it or they will not do it, then burn the place to the ground. And so what's effectively happened here is that Magneto and Xavier have made an enemy out of what could arguably be considered one of the deadliest mutants in existence. Because how can you catch what you can't see? And that's the nature of Mystique, to kind of keep from being caught. And it's, it's kind of a crazy thing. And so essentially, it all looks like it's getting ready to fall apart. It all looks like it's getting ready to end. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. Thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you all later. Peace.